Vice-Chancellor, um, Professor Director Goldin, um, all of you, thank you very much for coming. Um, I've leaned heavily on my friendships in Oxford in the course of the preparation of, uh, of this review. Um, people like Paul Klemperer and Cameron Hepburn and, and many others have very, been very generous with your advice during the course of all this, and I thank you, I thank you all. And I'll keep coming for advice on whatever the next subject is. I was, I've already had a, a feeling of great achievement here today um, because I got in. Um, the, the first time I tried to get into the examination schools was in the summer of uh, 1971. I, I was a university lecturer in, uh, wait for it, industrial mathematics and um, a fellow of, of CATS. And I'd set the OR paper in the engineering and, e engineering and economics uh, course. I was, I was already 25, but I didn't look it. And uh, I arrived in, you know, the dress that one, I don't know if one still has to wear this stuff, but I, uh, I arrived in the examination dress and they refused to let me in on the grounds that uh, the doors were not, not yet open for those who were taking the exams. <laughs> uh, so uh, I did feel a little smile as I walked up the steps and success as I got through the, uh, the door. Um, the, this is the first of the James Martin uh, lectures, and uh, I'm enormously honoured to have been asked. It, this seems to be the, an act of generosity of the kind that we as academics dream of, and very rarely happen. So it's wonderful to be here uh, for, for in, in the, as the inaugural James Martin uh, lecture, and it is, um, I think, pretty obvious that this is... Uh, quintessentially a subject of the, not only the 21st century, but also of the centuries that, uh, that follow. Um, thank you, Vice Chancellor, for the very kind introduction. Um, it was nearly all right. Um, I, I, there's one correction I would make, uh, the, and that is I was asked to do this um, by Gordon Brown, and then I reported, no, but I reported to both. Uh, <laughs> And the previous year, I reported to both Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister, on the Commission for Africa, so I've got some experience. And uh, as you all know, Gordon Brown is not currently the, the Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, what I want to do is to take you um, fairly quickly through the review. Um, taking you fairly quickly through the review will take about 50 minutes because... Uh, it's a long review. But I want to do, as I go, I want to interweave in the story the kinds of interactions we've had of a really interesting kind, at least for me, in the few months since the report was published. So it'll be a bit of the review and it'll be a bit of the, uh, the uh, experience since the review. The academic interactions, the policy interactions, and so on. I'll try to weave it in as we go. The, um, the two parts to the story, corresponding to two parts to the review, which is the first part is uh, why we should act, and uh, we argue that we should act on scale and urgently. And the second is how you do it. What kind of policy instruments should you be using in the course uh, to, to put that action into practice? So those are the two parts of the story. But I thought I'd start off because it gives it some context and actually introduces some of the issues by giving you the reasons that uh, I've heard and you've probably heard why you should not act then those of you who are convinced by the reasons why you should not act can save the rest of the time they can leave uh, in, a, in three or four minutes from now. Um, the, the first reason why you should not act is that you believe that the science is uh, all nonsense. Um, now, that's a free country. You can uh, think what you like. But I think that the way in which the evidence is built up over time, encapsulated, for example, in the recent uh, IPCC uh, fourth assessment report of the science, uh, the summary of which was released in, in Paris at the beginning of this month, I think that the scientific debate should be regarded as uh, overwhelmingly clear about the um, uh, human origins of a big part of climate change and what will come later. Now, there's some very distinguished scientists who uh, take a different view. Um, Nigel Lawson, for example, is uh, not convinced um, by the science, but I think most people who've thought about it carefully from a scientific uh, perspective have taken the science. So to, to reject the science, I think, now should be regarded as absurd. And that's, of course, something we did not do. We were consumers of the science. We took advice from the finest authorities in the land, uh, at least two of which I know that I took advice from are here in the audience today, so I, 
I thank John and Bob for, uh, for that. But we talked to people as best we could. We also talked to some of the scientific dissenters, but we were consumers of the science. So we did not, I did do a mathematics degree in my youth, but obviously that does not qualify you to second guess the science. I wish some economists would uh, uh, come to the same conclusion. The, so to reject the science surely now is absurd. The second thing to do is to say, well, human beings are fantastically adaptable. Human race, you know, deals with whatever comes along. It's fine, you know, let it come if it does come, and we'll sort it out and react and change things in our lives when it comes along. Now, I think the scale of the uh, possible temperature changes which we now see, uh, we know, I think, that under business as usual, there's a, a, a likelihood, actually, a more, more than 50% probability that if we go on as business as usual, we'll end up, uh, by the end of this century, in a position where it's really more likely than not we'd go above 5 degrees centigrade higher relative to uh, pre-industrial times um, as a result, eventually. Now, that is enormous. Five degrees centigrade is the distance between now and uh, the last ice age, 10 to 12,000 years ago. We do not know what kind of effects it will have, but I was lecturing uh, the day before yesterday in Toronto, and I learned that uh, during that last ice age, Canada was under a mile of ice. I mean, surely it's clear that changes of that kind transform the physical geography of the world, they transform therefore the human geography of the world and would lead to, for example, migration on a massive scale. And uh, these are the kinds of uh, changes which surely it would be just uh, too facile to believe that we can adapt to in any very, very simple way. So the second argument, yeah, it comes, we'll adapt, is I think now seem to be reckless. So the first one's absurd, the second one is reckless. The third one, you can believe me if you like, the, uh, the third one is to say that the future doesn't matter. This thing comes down the track somewhere, you know, well, we live for now, and uh, the future's the future, and I don't care particularly about the future. Uh, called in the jargon of economics a high pure time discount rate. Now, um, that I think is simply unethical. I've tried before the report was published, I've tried since the report was published, I have not heard a serious ethical argument that uh, is anywhere near persuasive about why you should have high pure time discount rates. I've heard lots of arguments about I know people with low pure time discount rates, but that's not the question. It's a very different question. It's an ethical question about the allocation across generations uh, of, um, of resources and environmental resources and the environment itself and so on. So those are the three reasons why you can forget about uh, climate change, um, reach for the hat and the sunglasses, and uh, they are, I think, uh, in that order uh, absurd, reckless, and unethical. So those of you who want to stay, I will try to convince you why um, we have to act uh, quickly. Now, first, let's go into the uh, economics of the story. This is, in, this is an externality. It's an externality which, which is quite unlike the externalities that we normally deal with. We normally deal with things like congestion, smoke pollution, and so on, local externalities where you can see the effects very quickly. We all knew that the uh, uh, average average uh, travel speed in London in a car had dropped to walking pace um, and then we acted on the congestion charge. We knew in London in the 50s, those of you who remember, um, that the smog was killing people. You could see it and you could see that you knew the people were dying and you knew why. It was very clear and it was local. It was now and it was local. This is a very different story. Um, this is global, it's long term. It's long term for a very important reason to all this analysis. Um, is that it's a flow stock problem. We flow, the emissions that we emit each year flow into the atmosphere and that stock builds up. And it's very difficult. CO2 lasts at least 100 years, probably longer, and it's very difficult to get it out. So this is a flow stock problem, it's a ratchet effect. And that's a very important feature of this whole analysis because it makes the issue a long-term issue. It makes it difficult for people to see directly the consequences of their actions. So that's a very important part of the, uh, of the whole story. And it means that if you delay, you're building up this stock and you're getting into an ever more difficult position. So this long-term nature and the stock accumulation story is very important to the whole structure. It's a very uncertain effect. Um, 
There's uncertainty about relationships between emissions and activity. There's uncertainty about relationships between the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the temperature. Uh, it's obviously the stock that affects the temperature because it's the stock that traps the energy, stops it from leaving the Earth. So there's lots of uncertainties in this. There's uncertainties about the relationship between temperature and uh, ultimate effects on the physical and economic environment. This is uncertain all the way through, and there are lots of uh, probabilities involved. This has to be about the economics of risk and uncertainty. I will very briefly at one point make the distinction between risk and uncertainty in the Knight and Keynesian manner because that's quite important to some aspects of the argument. But essentially there's risk and uncertainty in this and these effects are potentially large and irreversible. That makes it a very different kind of externality from the one that economists usually deal with. And that means that we have to think about the economics of risk. Just putting in average values, on average the outcome is likely to be this, misses a very big part of the argument. It is inevitably ethical. I mean, serious economic policy without ethics is, uh, in general, something that uh, is not really uh, credible. But in this case, the ethics of it all kick in very hard indeed. And we have to have that discussion. And again, it's been a bit worrying the way in which people try to duck away from that. Um, but I don't think it, you can really deal with this issue without facing the ethics directly. And of course, this is global, and it's, uh, it's global in its origins, and something that's emitted from uh, Australia and something that's emitted from the UK has exactly the same effect. It's global in its origins, and it's global in its impacts. Um, it's, the impacts, of course, are not the same for people. Uh, this, this is, uh, there's some deep inequities in this uh, story. It's the rich countries who are responsible for most of the stuff that's up there, and it's the poor countries that will be hit earliest and hardest, but will all be hit. Um, California will be uh, uh, still more um, uh, uh, water stressed than it is now. You'll get uh, hurricanes in the Gulf of um, Mexico and the Caribbean. Um, sea level rise will affect Florida. London will be in some, under some difficulty, much wetter winters and much uh, warmer summers. Those of you who know London well will know that from time to time the, uh, the sewers discharge into the Thames, which is not a pretty smell or sight, and that kind of stress will hit London. Storm surges up the Thames. It, it is true that Africa, India, other parts of the world will be hit earliest and hardest. There's a great inequity there, uh, inequity in the origins, inequity in the effects, but Still, we have to realize that we're all in this together and we will all be hit. So this is something that's global in its origins, global in its effects, and if it's to be controlled, it has to be global in its action. So this is an international collective action problem. And those, as we know, are extremely difficult to move. But I do think, and I'll say a little bit about the end, I've actually got more optimistic about it moving. Whether I'm optimistic enough to believe it will be movement fast enough or on the right kind of scale, I don't yet know. And none of us really know that. But uh, the movement, I think, in the last year or so has been strongly in a uh, good direction. So how does all this work? Well, I can't go into any of the details here, but a lot of it works through water. Storms, floods, droughts, sea level rise. A lot of it works through heat stress itself, of course. The thousands uh, who died in Europe in the summer of 2003, that was mostly heat stress. Um, heat stress combined with ignorance and unpreparedness, but it was heat stress. So, and those of you who have lived and worked in India will know that it gets very hot in uh, April and May and uh, that you get bigger increases in temperature over land than over sea and so on. So the kind of heat stress that would be involved would also be important. But mostly it works through water. It works, of course, through agricultural growing seasons uh, in all sorts of ways. But it is uh, something that happens in, uh, in this way, through, largely through water. It's very important because, you know, you can go and if you talk, talk to uh, the bloke in the pub, he'll say, well, I don't mind being, you know, three, four degrees centigrade warmer. Sounds good to me. And uh, you have to realise just the way in which these effects manifest themselves. Lots of um, real threat to uh, ecology and species. One of the things I would have wished we did more on in the review was to look at that in greater detail than we actually had time to do. Now, let's look at this uh, flow stock process by starting with the stocks. We are currently at 430 parts per million of CO2 equivalent. We're adding about 2.5 parts per million a year, and that 2.5 is going up. So in eight years from now, we'll be, uh, roughly speaking, eight, ten years from now, we'll be at 450. Now, uh, the, what we've got here is a 90% confidence interval. The red thing is a 90% confidence interval for um, the eventual 
eventual temperature increases relative to pre-industrial times associated with stabilisation at 450 parts per million CO2 equivalent. Um, once it gets up there, it's not impossible to get it out, but you have to wait a very long time and you'd have to act very strongly, you'd have to stop it rising. You can overshoot in this game, but it's pretty tough and it takes quite a long time to come back down again and you do lots of damage, of course, while you're overshooting. So 450 parts per million uh, is roughly where we'll be uh, and it gives you a 50-50 chance of being above or below 2 degrees centigrade. Now the red thing we've got here is taken uh, basically from the, um, the book um, edited by John Schellenhuber, who's here today, um, Avoiding Dangerous Climate Change, which was published at the um, beginning, of, um, to, beginning of 2005. Now, uh, most of the probability distributions we have are taken from that and associated literature. But the dotted lines on this graph show that we could have actually taken probability distributions which give higher spreads than the ones, in fact, we did. We were relatively modest in that choice of probability distributions, fairly central, and it's more or less where the IPCC fourth assessment report did come out. Not because we were prescient relative to them, we drew on the literature that the scientists involved in that report were themselves creating, so uh, it's not surprising that we came out roughly the same place. Now, 550 parts per million, 50-50 chance of being above or below 3 degrees centigrade. Now, many people, and I think for very good reason, would regard um, 550 parts per million CO2 equivalent as a pretty dangerous place to be. 50-50 above or below 3 degrees centigrade relative to pre-industrial times. That is uh, a degree centigrade higher than those who started out down this road to classified, and for good reason, dangerous climate change. So 550 is already a pretty dangerous uh, place to be. So we ended up arguing that the kind of range that we should deal, range we should aim for, subject to looking at the costs, and that will come in a moment, the aim we should, aim, the, where we should aim for, somewhere between 450 and 550 parts per million, at a stabilisation goal. We should have a discussion where in that uh, range we should try to be. Some people indeed have got cross with me of, of not going below 450 parts per million as a relevant range. But at least 550 should be seen as absolute upper bound, um, just from the point of view of the kinds of risks that you run. With 550 parts per million, there's a serious probability of being above 4 degrees centigrade, and on some models, a small probability of being above 5 degrees centigrade. So 550 parts per million is a pretty risky place to be. If we went on under business as usual, that 2.5 parts per million that we're adding each year would go up. And it's, I think, reasonable to suppose, given the growth of the poor countries, that under business as usual, averaged over a century, that 2.5 parts per million could at least be 4. I mean, below initially and above afterwards. That would be adding 400 parts per million in a century, and that would take us off the bottom of this scale uh, over 800 parts per million. And at that kind of level, you've got uh, a, uh, at least a 50% chance of ending up above 5 degrees centigrade. So business as usual in that sense is, sh is surely not the kind of thing that we could contemplate actually doing. So that's the story of the stocks. I'll come back to the flows in a, uh, a minute. Now, I've described the kinds of things that can happen to you in a rather uh, informal way. We do try to describe them in more detail regionally and on the different dimensions in uh, chapters 3, 4, and 5 of the, re of the review. Now, my own view is that if you tell somebody, and I'll anticipate the cost side here, if you tell somebody that for 1% of world GDP per annum, you could avoid the kinds of risks that I just very quickly described and described in a bit more detail in the review, if, if you had that choice, you could pay 1% of your GDP per annum, that's like a one-off 1% 1 increase in a cost index, one-off, prices go up once and they're permanently higher, a one-off 1% 1 increase in your cost index, would you pay that in order to get the kinds of reduction of risk that we're talking about, you know, the difference between 800 and something parts per million and down below 550 parts per million? I think most serious policymakers would be able to look at that kind of question and give you an answer to it. However, economists like adding things up. Now, um, it's actually a bit tricky to add all these things up because we don't have full coverage of all the areas and all the dimensions under all the possible scenarios and all the possible probability distributions over the scenarios. So it's quite difficult to do the adding up in any serious way. So what do economists do? Well, they throw away most of the information and they build an aggregative model. Um, well, you know, it's a, 
again, you know, I, I've always believed in freedom of pleasure. If people want to do that, that's fine. I actually think that there's good reason for doing that because you start to explore the logic of the argument. You can change assumptions in a way that you can easily understand. So I do think that's worth doing, and we did it. But I did want to emphasize that this was a supplementary argument. It was not the only argument, or even for me and for many others, the main argument. But it's an important supplementary argument that allows you to explore certain things. So I think it's well worth doing. Now, the kinds of results you get, well, you have to calibrate them. You have to average effects over time. You have to average effects over space, over geography. And you have to average effects over uh, the stochastic outcomes, the uncertain outcomes. There's three kinds of averaging going on here. We use the standard sort of form that economists often use. I don't know how many people are economists here, but you'll have to um, bear with me for just uh, a moment. We, we took the uh, expectation of a utility integral, where utilities at each point in time are weighted by population. And that's what we did. Now, it's quite hard for people to understand the expectation of discounted integrated utils. It's not a unit that springs naturally to mind. So what we did was we calibrated it in terms of what definite consumption level, if it grew at a rate appropriate for the model, and we can discuss what that might be, but what consumption level, if it grew at this rate, would give you the same utility integral as the one you've just calculated in terms of expectations and integration over time and discounting. We call that the uh, balanced growth equivalent, which uh, Jim Murleys and I concocted here in Oxford in the uh, early 1970s. So that's the way we calibrate it. So we're thinking in terms of percentage of consumption, percentage of consumption over the indefinite future. And it's a way of calibrating this quite complicated animal, which is the expectation of the discounted utility integral. So bearing that in mind in terms of calibration, we've got something which, at least informally, you can compare with a, say, 1% cost of mitigating. So that's, that's the way we did it. It's kind of heuristic, simple device, but one which I think enables conversation about decisions. So that's what we did. And uh, obviously, the uh, number you come up with will depend on what kinds of effects you include. And the number you come up with will depend on what you're assuming about climate change. Now, baseline climate change, we took as the, a rather conservative standard um, uh, indication of the probability distribution over outcomes associated with the kind of diagram I just showed you uh, and uh, what is standard in, for example, the book um, Avoiding Dangerous Climate Change. On the other hand, there are many things that the scientists know are worries that they have not yet calibrated to a sufficient degree to include in these models. All kinds of carbon feedbacks in which there are many people here much more qualified to describe than I am. We included just one of them in a movement from base to high, and that is a first stab at the possible effects. We didn't calculate it. We drew on what others had done of the thawing of the permafrost and the release of the methane. But there are all kinds of other effects that uh, we're learning much more about associated with the carbon feedbacks, associated with the absorptive capacity of the oceans, which seems to be decreasing, all kinds of issues associated with the possible dieback of the Amazon and other forests. There are all kinds of things which we know are worries, which are not in the probability distributions that uh, we've got here. So the baseline to the high is simply one step along that way. There could be many more steps along that way. There's a great deal of uncertainty that we left out of this, and it would, I think, push unambiguously in the direction of higher costs. I'll come to some sensitivity analysis on the costs in just a moment. So if you include more things, if you go beyond GDP and go to non-market stories, then you move up from 5% to 11%. If you go on and then look at broad impacts, move from the broader, in, the broader climate impacts, the high climate, you move from 11% to 14%. We included very little in the way of distribution uh, formally. We great great emphasis on distribution issues in the report as a whole, but in the formal modeling we didn't. And if you talk about intra-generational distribution, then that would add still more. We didn't actually formally calculate that, but we reckoned, and with some back of the envelope and looking at other people's work, that would bump your 14% up to 20%. So those, that's when you hear that our estimate of costs of uh, the damages of climate change being 5 to 20%, that's where they come from. Now, if you're averaging over time, you have to make value judgments about 
the future relative to now. You have to make value judgments about income distribution, and I'll come to those in just a minute when we talk about the sensitivity analysis. Now, we did say in our book um, a, a number of times that you should not take these models too literally. Why? Because we thought that people would take these models too literally. And surprise, surprise, they did take these models too literally. But we did do some sensitivity analysis with the models, and I'll come to it in just a moment. Now, the first thing I wanted to do was to show the kind of range of our uncertainty relative to some of our predecessors. The fund is a pre previous model. The Dice Rice is a previous model. Dice Rice is a, has been a very interesting and valuable workhorse in this area, which Bill Nordhaus uh, put together, somebody who's done very important work in this area. But the page 2002 is the model we used. Page, I, won't, I haven't got time to go into detail here, but the page 2002 model was developed by Chris Hope in uh, Cambridge. He kindly made it available to us. And the great advantage of the page 2002 model is that it uh, allows you to vary the parameters in a Monte Carlo way to generate the distributions. Those of you who have not been introduced to Monte Carlo, um, what you do is take lots of examples um, defined in a certain way, the sampling of those examples, and you end up with a probability distribution of outcomes, which is called a Monte Carlo. You can't actually calculate the distributions directly. It's too complicated, but you can simulate them in this way, and that's why it's called Monte Carlo. So that's the uh, page 2002, and that's the reason we chose it. It was, was for two reasons, and there's one supplementary important reason, but the, the two reasons, it brings in uncertainty in a way that's much easier to handle. And Indeed, uncertainty is not really there in in many of the previous models. Not all of them, but a lot of them is not there. So uh, uncertainty, risk and uncertainty is of the essence, so we wanted it there. And also the page model is constructed in a way that spans the range of other models. It was deliberately, deliberately designed to sort of collect together the previous models and model them in a stochastic way. So that's why we use page. The supplementary reason was Chris Hope's a nice bloke and he helped us use his model. And that, so those of you who tried to use other people's model is that you always need the model builder if you'll be able to do it. So the IPCC recent results, the IPCC fourth assessment report, that's the AR4, is, uh, you can see, actually a bit uh, shifted upwards in its distribution relative to the ones we used. So some people have said we exaggerated the science. I really didn't understand that. I think there's no way in which we've exaggerated the science, as the IPCC report, which came out in February this year, demonstrates. And uh, we've left out a lot of uh, risks, as I, as I emphasised. The, the Mineshausen is the, comes from the book, which I mentioned, uh, Avoiding Dangerous Climate Change. So I think that on the science side, and the probability distribution side, we are fairly cautious. I don't know if the aged amongst you at the back row can actually read this, but... Um, I think we'll, it'll go up on the web, won't it? Because so I'll, I'll, the detail doesn't matter too much. What we did then um, is to, we did some sensitivity analysis. We did some sensitivity analysis in the week or two after publication in response to requests, and that's included in the book, which is published in January by Cambridge University Press. The um, I guess Oxford didn't bid for it. The, uh, <laughs> the um, so we we said first. Um, Let's look at the structure of the model, and then let's look at the value judgments applied to the model. So two separate blocks of sensitivity analysis. This slide is model structure. Next slide is the values. So um, we used an emission scenario um, from the IPCC, which we felt modelled the uh, emissions as plausi more plausibly than some of the other scenarios, at least business as usual emissions more plausibly than other scenarios. Um, on the other hand, it had quite a high population growth rate in it, probably implausibly high. So the first thing we asked is, well, what if you had the same emissions and a lower population growth? Um, think of all this as deviations from 11%. Take the 11% number that I had in the, in the uh, uh, preceding slide and think of this as deviations from that. That would knock down our estimates by about uh, of damages by about 4%. Now, the damage function in all this, damages are a power function of temperature in these models where that power function is distributed, but it's distributed over quite a small range. And we felt it was implausibly small given what we were learning. If you push that right up, it's a range from 1.3 to, to 3. If you put all the weight on 3, which is quite a big change, of course, but if you shoved it right up to 3, you'd add 20% to the damages. 
Economic growth, people have said our economic growth rate's too low. Maybe. You never know about long-run growth rates. But the, if the economic growth rate is too low, then um, if you bump it up, you'd do two things. You would mean that emissions grow more rapidly and you would have a, uh, um, a less weight on the future because the future would be more wealthy relative to now and that would give you a lower weight. So two effects and our experimentations on that suggested that nevertheless it would be a positive effect. We assume in the model that damages stop rising after, two, after 2200 and uh, that of course curtails the damage if you relax that assumption it would bump up the damages. I've already said that there's a lot of risk left out of this that would bump up the damages. Um, there's nothing explicitly in here about irreversibility in the model. Um, there's an option value on that and that would uh, uh, bump up the damages if you folded that in. And I think in these models we should have a very strongly rising relative price of um, standard goods and environmental goods. Um, if you think of that very in very simple terms. If you, um, if you doubled the ratio of goods to environmental goods, you can think of the environmental goods as flows coming from an environmental stock. If you doubled that, if the elasticity of substitution between those things was a half, I told you that those non-economists don't have to worry about all the words for a minute, then you'd actually be uh, bumping up the price by a factor of four. So we're thinking, of course, of much bigger changes of that. We're thinking of growth quite strong over time. You're thinking of uh, environmental goods that are deteriorating. So I think in these models, the relative price of environmental goods and consumption goods should be going up very rapidly. Now, I don't think the models, at least in my view, take full account of that. There are all kinds of reasons, then, from the structural side of the model, why we may have underestimated things, the exception being the over-rapid uh, population uh, growth, which would bring down the estimates. Now, let's turn to the, um, the uh, value judgments in the model. Ethics, of course, absolutely central to this. And this is where a lot of discussion has taken place. Some of it very muddled, some of it not so muddled. Um, the pure rate of time preference is one I've already raised and I've emphasized that I see no reason uh, ethically for a strong number on the pure rate of time preference. We chose one-tenth of one percent as a probability that the Earth might be hit by a meteorite and disappear altogether. That's a possibility. Uh, you know, one in a thousand per year actually is quite a high probability for that. The fact that we've got a low time discount rate here is relevant to this being about the planet. Yeah? Um, the, I think it's, wouldn't it, Joe Stiglitz have a story about two planets uh, meet each other in, uh, in space or, and have a conversation and one says to the other, how are you? And the other one says, well, not very well. And he says, well, what's the problem? He says, homo sapiens. And then the other one says, oh, don't worry, they're not around for long. Is the, uh, <laughs> uh, but for the course of time we're thinking about, we're assuming that the Earth will be around and that's why we have a low pure time discount rate. And it's very different from the story about a project or a sector. Now, the, uh, the other part of the story is how do, we, um, how do we look at the benefits which occur in the future relative to benefits that occur now from the point of view of the argument that the people in the future will, we suppose, be richer than we are now. Now, that seems to me to an, be an eminently respectable reason for discounting, and it is in our model. Now, of course, how hard that kicks in depends on the growth rate and it depends on your value judgments of people in the future, of, of people with higher and lower incomes. How much do you care about people with higher and lower incomes? Now, let me give you what uh, E3 equals 1 says. If you take somebody who has five times the resources of somebody else and you move a unit of resource from the person who um, has... Uh, five times to the person who has one-fifth of the other, then you say that uh, the unit of resource in the hands of the poorer person, if E3 equals one, is um, five times as high, or the unit of resource in the hands of the richer person is worth 20% of the other person, one over five. That's what E3 equals one says. E3 equals two, which actually I and a number of other right-minded people would go along with, 
is the, uh, would say that uh, it's 1 25th. Now, you have to think about that. Lots of people have said, I know e3 equals 2. I have no clue where they really know that from, and uh, some of us, including Cameron Hepburn here, have tried to think hard about these kind of questions. Um, but you'd have to say, if you believe that e3 equals 2, that um, if you took a dollar from a person earning five times as much as somebody else, you could lose up to 96% of it on the way. This is a famous Okun leaky bucket. You could lose up to 96% of it on the way, and it still would be a good transfer to make. So those of uh, our comrades who tell us that they know ETA is two or more should be writing to their MP, and indeed most of them are American, they should be writing to their senator, explaining that this is their choice of value judgments. Actually, I don't have much trouble with that, but um, it, you have to be clear about the consistency of what you're saying. Now, I've already said that when we, if we centre on 11% as our reduction from the previous slide, that we had nothing in there for intragenerational distribution. And if you bring that in, I've already said you can bump that up quite considerably. Francois Bourguignon, actually, my successor as chief economist of the bank, has independently done some uh, back of the envelope work on that and gets to quite similar numbers. So I think on the whole, the numbers that we came up with are actually quite central relative to where you could come. You could bump them up from the point of view of um, things missed out on the, on the structural side. You can bring them down if you disagree with us about our value judgments. But if you do, then let's have a discussion. We can't settle the value judgments. We cannot because they're value judgments. We should consider a range, and we did. But um, we should have that discussion seriously and explicitly, not park it in some other part of economics that we, uh, or moral philosophy that is irrelevant to all this. So that's the story of the results we, we, got, we came to and the um, sensitivity. I'm going to have to accelerate because uh, I want to say a fair bit about uh, policy. So what if we do come up with this conclusion? So basically what I've said is that these damages are very big. I've already told you what the uh, costs of avoiding most of those damages would be. Well, not all of them, of course, but most of them, 1% of GDP. So basically the economics of this is that the costs of action are far less than the cost of inaction. And that uh, if we're to bring down below 550 parts per million, we'd better act soon. And that's what's illustrated in this graph here. I've spoken previously about stocks. Let's move to flows. The flows that uh, are associated with 550 parts per million, are not, there's not a single path of getting there. You can do a bit more now and a bit <coughs> less later, you know, a bit less now, a bit more later. You can get to 550 parts per million in different ways. But uh, this yellow is an example of the kinds of paths that get you to 550 parts per million. The one at the bottom is the kind of path that could get you to 450 parts per million. But the key lesson from this is if we're to choose a target as modest from the environmental point of view as 550 parts per million, we have to peak within 20 years and then come down. Now, if you think about that, this is as a world, we'd have to cut by 30% by 2050. Absolutely. <coughs> So if the economy is three times as high, three times as large by then, then you'd have to cut in terms of carbon to output or greenhouse gases to output, you'd have to cut by 90%. If you think about the rich countries versus the poor countries, I would emphasize the inequity of this process. What we argue in the report is that if we're to cut as a world by 30% in a reasonably equitable way, that means the rich countries should be cutting absolutely by 60 to 80%. Now, California, not yet a country, has an 80% target for uh, reductions by 2050. France has the factor 4, it's 75% uh, reductions by 2050. The UK has a 60% target by 2050. Of course, we measure it in ways that make it a bit tougher for us. Uh, um, you know, it depends when you start, it depends what greenhouse gases you include. These numbers are not directly comparable. But basically, you're seeing people come up with 60 or 80%. I was in Canada um, the day before yesterday, and there the discussion is, has suddenly become alive about what those 2050 targets would be. Um, the week before, I testified to the Energy, Com Energy Committee of the Senate, and the discussion there is how big those targets should be. It's really become quite intense, and it's become a, a discussion about the right issues. What kind of goals should we have for 2050, and then what kind of intermediate goals should we have along the way? The European Commission is taking to the Spring Summit a target of a 20% reduction by 2020 
and an extra 10%, 30% reduction if other people come along. That's the right ballpark. That's the kind of thing that could get you to these reductions in rich countries that we're thinking about. So I do think the discussion is moving in the right direction. It, is a, it, it involves radical changes in the way we use energy, but it doesn't involve radical changes in our way of life. If you turn the lights on, they'll still come on, but it'll be generated by carbon-free electricity. If you drive your car, it might be electric, uh, it might be biofuels, it might be hydrogen, we'll see. Um, but it can be non-hydrocarbon. So these are the kinds of changes we have to make, radical in some areas, but not actually radical about way of life. The uh, cost of all this, I've already trailed this a number of times, around 1% of GDP. Um, it'll depend on the sectors, but it means on average costs going up by 1%. You know, less in the financial sector, more in aluminium. It depends where you look. But on average, it would average out around 1%. Those of you who want to get some feel for the sort of ballpark that's involved here, um, five, uh, the UK, the uh, primary energy is a fraction of GDP, is around 3%. Other countries, 4 or 5%. Depends where you look. So if the average price, say in the UK, of primary energy or equivalent price of primary energy went up by about 30%, that would give you the 1% increase in the cost index. So I think it satisfies a sort of common sense uh, ballpark calculation. We did it from, uh, in two ways. We did it by looking at the specifics of technology, the possibilities for energy efficiency, the story of um, deforestation and so on. And uh, Dennis Anderson, I can see halfway back here, Professor of uh, Energy Policy at Imperial College, uh, guided us on that. So that was one route into the story. The uh, second route into the story is to look at all the other calculations everybody else has made and uh, see what they uh, average out to. And again, it was averaging out around 1%. I learned the language of meta-study. A meta-study is, is looking at everybody else's study and coming up with... Uh, some kind of explanation of roughly where they come out. It's not an average, it's, you know, because everybody does things in different ways and it's not that simple, it's not simply an average. But So we, Terry Barker uh, of Cambridge kindly did a uh, study for us and we come out around 1%. After we published um, the International Energy Agency in Paris, a, a very serious international agency looking at energy issues, came out with something actually a bit lower uh, than us. So. I think that people have said we've exaggerated the science, not true, look at the IPCC fourth assessment report. Uh, people have said we exaggerated the costs, not true, look at the International Energy uh, Association. And I've already given you the sensitivity analysis on the damages. And of course, as you do cut the, as you do change the way in which you uh, generate energy, move away from hydro hydrocarbons, there are all kinds of other co-benefits which I won't go into in any detail. After dirty water, the biggest uh, environmental threat to life in developing countries is in-hut smoke from cooking. So if you move away from uh, the uh, hydrocarbons, these are the kinds of co-benefits that you can uh, come across. There will also be big opportunities. It's quite possible, we don't overdo it, I don't think, but it's quite possible to tell a story that this could launch a Schumpeterian, as you like your economic history, this could launch a Schumpeterian uh, uh, wave of investment in new technologies which could actually accelerate growth. Um, we didn't want to pretend there's a free lunch here. I mean, we think there is a cost, but you do have to think about the opportunities generated by the new technologies as well. So key research questions, look at the weights in the tail of distributions, explore the ethics explicitly, and do much more detailed regional and sectoral studies. Don't jump straight to the aggregation. Those of you who know me won't be surprised that uh, I'm going to look in more detail at, at India. Now, policy. I'm going to do it very fast, but I can do it, I think, in 10 minutes, if you allow me. So 10 minutes on policy. Um, this is an externality. You've got to price the externality. Basic undergraduate economics and very sound. People, if people don't face the costs of their actions, they will face the wrong incentives. And that's why we called this the biggest market failure the world has ever seen. Why? Well, I think it's pretty obvious in the sense that uh, everybody is doing it. it. involves everybody. We all engage in emitting carbon in some shape or form and it affects everybody and it affects some people in very big ways. Um, so this is a big market failure. You should be taking action to correct the market failure. 
carbon pricing, you can do cap and trade schemes of the kind in the European Union Emissions Trading Scheme, you can do taxation, or you can do implicit prices through regulation where you insist that people use a more expensive piece of equipment, that saves carbon, and the uh, implicit price is the, on a flow basis, the uh, ratio between those things. So fix the price. If you were absolutely neurotically char Chicago and all this, you'd say that that's all you have to do. Now, I don't think that that's just, and it's a, and it's a serious argument. First fix the market price, first fix the market failure, fix the externality. Is that enough? No, because all this depends on people having total confidence in the wisdom of nations acting together into the indefinite future. It's possible that the agents in the marketplace don't have that confidence. And that is a reason for acting directly to promote uh, research development and deployment. There are, of course, the usual reasons that an idea is itself an externality, and that applies to all, it applies to promotion of all research and development. What I'm emphasizing here is that there's a particular reason beyond the standard argument associated confidence in future policy. Um, also, I think you can make an argument to do with risk and urgency for doing it as well, why it's particularly important in this area. Finally, there's related uh, market failures. People don't necessarily invest in insulating house, houses if the, as a landlord if they don't think that the tenant uh, will pay a higher rent or sufficiently higher rent to offset that investment. There are all kinds of other market failures here. People don't understand the importance of energy efficiency. Maybe the markets don't work well enough. It may be that uh, energy efficiency is a bad investment, but many people, I think, would not take that view, at least not in a number of areas. There's also behavioural change. I won't dwell on it, but economists always think of sticks and carrots of incentives. And you, uh, you ignore sticks and carrots of incentives at your peril. You will screw up policy if you don't take that into account. So, but what I'm saying is there's something extra here. You can talk to people about responsible behaviour. People want to talk about responsible behaviour, and they'd be willing to change their own behaviour on that basis. We don't know how much, but I think that is a discussion just in, in terms of um, you know, John Stuart Mill's approach to governance and uh, democracy as government by discussion, that seems to me to be a very important discussion to have. We have changed our behaviour. Uh, those of you old enough to remember when we didn't recycle, uh, will remember that we didn't recycle. And uh, we didn't do it because it wasn't part of our judgement about responsible behaviour. So I think that's a very important part of the story as well. So that's broadly the legs, as it were, or the uh, axes of policy. And it sh we should remember, and this turned out to be very important in our discussions within Europe, we should remember that uh, as we've told the story, responsibility on climate change, economic growth and energy security fit quite well together. It's not a horse race between those three things. It's very important to recognise that because if we just take the European Union Commission as an example, but this is true in many governments, if you, the European Union has an environment minister, the worthy Mr. Demas, it has a, uh, an industry committee, the worthy Mr. Verheugen, and it has an energy commissioner, the worthy Mr. Peebles. Now, they all do their job, but I think up to last year sometime, they saw it a bit as competitive environment versus growth versus energy security. I think we're now seeing, and rightly so, that as being much more in harmony, and uh, for very good reason. Uh, if you think of energy efficiency, good for growth, good for uh, environment, good for energy security, renewables similarly, and so on. So I think whilst it, they're not exactly coincident, they're not, there's a much greater harmony between them than many people have uh, given credit for up to now. The one exception for that, and perhaps we can talk about it a bit more during questions, is carbon capture and storage for coal. Uh, coal is energy secure, there's lots of it about. India and China will be using at least 70% coal to generate um, their electricity for the next 30 or 40 years. Um, so that is the worst polluting of the hydrocarbons, and if you're going to use coal, as we can feel pretty sure you will, then carbon capture and storage will be extremely important. So I think that's... We tried to not to take strong views on technologies, no strong views on um, wind versus solar versus nuclear and so on. The one technology we did emphasise as being of crucial importance, not exclusively, far from it, was uh, carbon capture and storage for coal, simply from the basic empirical observation and forecast that this is going to be very widely used, so you'd better think hard about how to use it. Now,
carbon pricing, um, I've already said how you do it. Our approach to carbon pricing was like this. Identify your stabilization target. Identify the kinds of paths that you're going to need to follow to get there. And then use a price of carbon that will generate those kinds of emissions paths. That's the route we went. We didn't try in any detail, although we did discuss it somewhat, to talk about the social cost of carbon, which is an approach to externalities which tries to estimate the marginal damage from using or generating greenhouse gases. Um, we did do something on that, but our emphasis was that way round. We said the economics of risk of the Marty Weitzman kind, those, those of you who know the literature, his 1974 paper, points to us capping the quantities. And then you go down from that and you say, well, the economics of cost, if you want to cap quantities in the cheapest possible way, you should let the market seek out what way that is. So that's the way we got to prices. And that's the price story that we told, I think, on the basis of good economic theory. So the social cost of carbon for us was a, a relevant, interesting story, but a, a secondary story. And of course, if you're going to have policies which are going to guide the very long-term decisions, they have to be credible, flexible, and predictable. And that's not so easy to do, but we discussed ways of, of doing that. I've already emphasized technology. I've emphasized the learning processes here. And the, this graph shows how costs of electricity associated with given technologies have fallen with experience with technologies. So the claim that there's a learning process from which others can, uh, mothers from which others can garner knowledge from your own actions, I think, is borne out in this kind of sector. Um, the overall energy, the overall um, expenditure on on um, R and D in energy has dropped by 50% over the last 25 years. Surely a mammoth move in the wrong direction, and we argue that should be at least doubled. Um, if, uh, and that means an extra 10 billion a year, which is peanuts in relation to the kinds of issues we're talking about. International, international action very quickly. Well, you have to get international action on the kinds of dimensions I've already uh, uh, described, but also, of course, on adaptation, uh, also, of course, on deforestation and adaptation. Deforestation is a major source of uh, emissions. I'll say a word about it, too, only a word in a moment. Adaptation, of course, I haven't emphasized, but we do know that the temperatures are going to change quite strongly. In addition to 0.7 degrees C, they've already risen since pre-industrial times. Even if we act sensibly, it's likely to go up by another 2 degrees centigrade or so. Um, that will bring big changes, and we have to adapt to them, whether we're in London or Africa or elsewhere. So those are the international stories that we have to deal with. We, have, we, should, look for, we should look for efficiency, we should look for equity, and we should look at structures that sustain cooperation. And we do have to understand what others are doing. Part of the, on the road, as we went round, we explained that in China, that the Americans are actually doing quite a lot on R&D. There's California, there's um, the trading schemes in northeastern United States and so on. And when we were in the United States, we spent a lot of time telling them that China was doing quite a lot. Uh, China's reforesting, not deforesting. At the end of last year, they introduced an export tax on energy-intensive industries. You can't sell an American car in China. It doesn't meet the emissions targets. Beijing has an $8,000 uh, per annum tax on uh, SUVs. This is a... Uh, uh, China is changing. The United States is changing. They're both changing very rapidly. On the other hand, China is building a big uh, coal-fired power station uh, every week. And they're a big... I don't want to say that uh, it's all straightforward and everybody's on the way. But if we're to build international understanding, we have to give other people credit for what they're doing and say, let's scale up from there. What we can't say is that they're a bunch of rascals. They're not doing anything. I'm not going to do anything until everybody does everything. That's obviously a recipe for everybody doing nothing. And uh, so mutual understanding is very important. Building up international carbon markets, let me just emphasize that strong targets in rich countries gives you a demand side, it gives you scarcity. We need benchmarks so that uh, the supply of emissions reductions can be recognized. Those of you who buy bananas will know what you're buying. Most of you buy more bananas than you produce, and uh, you recognize a banana when you're buying it. Emissions trading is the same kind of issue, but you've got to be able to recognize the banana. And uh, you've got to be able to recognize an emissions reduction, and that means you have to have benchmarks. So that's a key challenge. I think we can work it out. Uh, I don't think that 
we should yet ask India, China and the other developing countries to take national caps. But we can have benchmarks based on technologies and, and, um, and uh, sectors. Deforestation, I won't dwell on it. It's a bigger source of emissions than transport. We have to try to work out ways. It's, it's low-hanging fruit in the sense of um, uh, just as energy efficiency is low-hanging fruit, we can get there quickly as we move strongly on other aspects. It has to be formulated by the countries where the trees stand. They know their communities. They know their societies. They know their economies. But they sh we all benefit from stopping deforestation. There should be international support. This climate change will make the whole development process much more difficult. I spent the previous year writing the report of the Commission for Africa, and we did manage to persuade the rich countries of the world to double their aid between, let me rephrase that, to promise to double their aid between 2005 and 2010, and the European Union has set targets to move to 0.7% of GDP by 2015. I was very tempted to say, well, actually, when we wrote that, we didn't understand climate change well enough. The bill's a bit higher than we thought. But having, with you and many others, Ian Goldin and I wrote a book on Case for Aid uh, four or five years ago, we bashed our head on this one, and uh, I didn't feel it would be politically sensible to go out and say, well, actually, the bill's a bit higher than we thought. Uh, if the rich countries deliver on their promises, we could go a long way to uh, promoting development and tackling adaptation at the same time. There are lots of global public goods that we could uh, invest in, as well as helping to strengthen the infrastructure, the irrigation schemes, the uh, water supplies, the seawalls and so on, all the kinds of things that will be necessary in the adaptation process in rich countries and in poor countries, but the strain, of course, particularly strong in the poor countries. Policy questions, and I'll stop. The, um, I think on the policy side, how we build up these emissions trading schemes will be of key importance. I've already mentioned carbon capture and storage, and uh, personally, I think that the whole way in which we plan for adaptation, understanding the regional effects of climate change, understanding how that should change development strategy, understanding how we need to re readjust our investments in London and other cities, I think that's of enormous importance. And as I said before, just as on the movement towards low-carbon technologies, I'm going to work on India. I'm going to work on India on adaptation too, and Africa as well. Okay. So those are the conclusions. I've already given them to you. We should end up somewhere between, aim somewhere between 450 and 550. We can do it uh, in a way that the costs are totally acceptable. The costs of action are much less than the costs of inaction. Action is the growth story. Inaction will eventually damage growth. It has to be done internationally, and we have to start now, because if we delay, even for 20 or 30 years, we'll have built up those stocks in a way that we're in a very difficult position. I'm sorry, by chance, I just ex exceeded my time by a few minutes, but I'll stop there. Thank you.